look at uh, a subject today um, that, that we'll start in Matthew 7.21. <clears throat> it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then the NIV, it says it a little bit differently, which I think might be a bit easier to understand. So same, same uh, verse in the NIV, it says, Not everyone who acknowledges me with the words, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who actually does the will of my Father. And then going on in verse 22 and 23, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, right? So they're doing many of the things that we would expect to, you know, from people who, who are following Christ. But then in 23, it says something interesting. It says, and then I, being Christ, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And this is what I want to look at today, this, this phrase, I never knew you. <clears throat> And we'll go just briefly into Strong's, and this word new, um, you know, what does it mean in strong? So in, it's Strong's number G1097, and it's a verb, right? So it's an action verb. It's something that uh, God has to actively do. He has to know you. And here's what Vine's Expository Dictionary says about this word, just a few of the few of the definitions. It says, it signifies to being taking in knowledge, to come to know, to recognize, understand, or to understand completely. In its past tenses, it frequently means to know in the sense of realizing. So you realize something, you come to know, come to know something you might not have originally known. And then it says, uh, another point about it, it says, to be known of God. Here, the knowing suggests approval and bears the meaning to be approved. Right, so this is, you know, it's a deep kind of knowing somebody. It's not just a casual, you know, hi, how are you doing? But it's some deep knowing of a person that typically happens over time. And then next, turn just a little bit further in Matthew. This is in Matthew 25, 6 through 13. And let's read uh, this, which is the, the parable of the virgins, which is another, I think, interesting um, piece here. So Matthew 25, verse 6, it says... And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming to go out to meet him. Then all who, those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And then in verse 9 it says, But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should, be enough, or should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And then in verse 11 it says, Afterwards the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. So again, this Lord, Lord, this acknowledging that Christ is the Lord. Um, and then in verse 12 it says, But he, being the Lord, answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So again, this phrase, I did not know you. And in both cases, you know, what happens is something that we would not want to have happen to us. And this no in this particular scripture is a little bit different. It's G1492, so that's Strong's G1492, but it's also a verb. And here's what Vine's Expository Dictionary has to say about this one. It says, to have seen or perceive, hence, to know, to have knowledge of, whether absolutely as in divine knowledge, or in the case of human knowledge, to know from observation. Right? So it's something that it's observed. It's, it's a kind of knowing where you see something happening, and then you know what it is. And what it goes on to say about these two words, it says, uh, this is Vine's Expository Dictionary, it says, the differences between... Uh, Genosco, which is the first one, and Oda, which is the second one, demands consideration. It says, Genosca frequently suggests inception or a progress in knowledge. So it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's not something that you learn all at once. It's something that you have to learn over time. It's a knowledge that only comes over time. 
And it says, while Oda suggests fullness of knowledge. So it suggests kind of that end state where you completely know something. And so this is what I want to look at today. And in particular, I want to explore how does God get to know us, right? We see that in both of these uh, both of these sections that it's important for God to know us, right? God has to deeply know us. We can't just be something where even if we're doing, you know, certain works that we might think of as Christian works or doing things that Christ would approve of, that's not enough, right? He has to actually know us. He has to know us deeply. He has to get to know us over time. And so that's what I want to do. I want to look today at how does God get to know you? How does God get to know us? So we'll look at some examples in, in the Old Testament, but I want to start off in Deuteronomy 8 to see what uh, Moses told the children of Israel about this subject. And this is an interesting time, uh, beginning of Deuteronomy, uh, just kind of to set the context. This is Moses retelling of the law, Moses retelling all the things that God had commanded to the children of Israel right up until the time they were supposed to go into the promised land. And in fact, this set of verses is the day before they cross into the cross the Jordan River, in fact. And we can see that in Deuteronomy 9. And this is from about Deuteronomy, I think, 4 and through the beginning of Deuteronomy. It's all of this section where Moses is talking to him right before, the day before they're to cross into the Jordan River. It says, or sorry, it's the day of, not the day before. So just Deuteronomy 9, verse 1, it says, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go into, and go in to depose nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven. Right? So he's talking to this second generation of Israelites, right? It's also right after God confirmed that Moses wouldn't be entering into the promised land. So, I believe it's in Deuteronomy 3, towards the end of chapter 3, where Moses asks again, right before they're about to go into the promised land, he asks, you know, will you let me go into the promised land? And God confirms because of his, his actions uh, with striking the rock that he's not going to be allowed to go into the promised land. So you could imagine what these words would mean to Moses, right? This is the last time that he's going to be speaking to the children of Israel. And in fact, as God was telling him that he wouldn't be going into the land of Israel, then he was also told to strengthen Joshua and to strengthen the children of Israel. So these were very you know, meaningful words, very choice words you could imagine that Moses was going to say. And this is, as I said, it's several chapters where Moses is talking. And we'll pick up in Deuteronomy 8 verse 1. Which is, you know, as I said, some way into the talk Moses is giving. And in Deuteronomy 8 verse 1, it says, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. <clears throat> and so we see, and this is a theme kind of throughout this section of Deuteronomy, Moses is reconfirming how important it is to keep these commandments, how important it is to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then in verse 2 it says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you. Right, And so we know the story, you know, all the stories and how the second generation must have felt. Right, They were you know, all the ones that were 20 years or younger. So they were young, you know, young adults at most, young children most likely, as they were going through this period. And so while we often think about God testing the first generation of Israelites, it's really the second generation that God is, is testing. Because we know that first generation had already failed their test, right? With Joshua and Caleb and uh, the others that went into the land and spied the land and came back with with the description of the land, that first generation had failed their test. And so what what Moses is saying here is that, you know, this 40 years in the wilderness was to humble and to test the second generation of Christians. And then it's interesting going on in verse 2, right? So we see this, this need to humble and test, but going on in verse 2, it says, to know what was in your heart. Right. So this concept of knowing, right, God used this 40 year period to actually know whether the children of Israel, the second generation of children of Israel 
would follow him, right? And it goes on to say, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And so this is the reason why the second generation of Israelites went through this 40 years in the wilderness, right? It was to be tested, to be humbled, so that God would know whether they would keep his commandments or not. And then it goes on in verse 3, it says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right? And so this, you know, Moses is <clears throat> telling the children of Israel that the way that God gets to know you, the way, God, the way God gets to know what's in your heart is by these tests, by these trials, by going through the process that he's laid out for you, whatever it is, you know, that he lays out for you in your life. And that these things are not by chance or just, you know, hap happenstance that come by, but it's something that God purposely does so that he can get to know what's in your heart. And we see also King David, and this is, you know, interesting, like, as I said, this was what Moses had said was near the end of his life. This is King David at the end of his life and what he tells Solomon and all of the children of Israel at that time. And it's very much the same thing. And I think it's, you know, no coincidence that both of these are from men of God, but men of God who near the end of their life, right? They've gone through it. They now realize what God was doing with them. And this is uh, King David in First Chronicles 28, verse 9. And he's speaking to his son Solomon. It says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Right, so very same uh, thoughts that were given by Christ in, in the Gospels. Right, This notion of God searches us. God understands our hearts. And if we are seeking him, right, if he's going to be found by us, then he gets to know us. Right, He gets to know us over time. And then it goes on a little further down in First Chronicles. This is in chapter 29. And this is a prayer uh, for Solomon and, to all, and for all the people. So this is 1 Chronicles 29, verse 17. It says, I know also, my God, that you test the hearts and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I, will willingly, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy, I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. So this is a prayer that he's giving in dedication to all that they had saved up for the temple. And so it goes on in verse 12. Uh, chapter 29 and verse 18, it says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the hearts of your people and fix their heart towards you and give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provisions. Right, and so we see here, you know, David, as I said, at the end of his life also is saying much the same thing, right? He's asking God and telling his son Solomon that this is what the Lord does, that he searches out what's in your heart. He sees what you do over time and that this is how he gets to know you, right? This is how he allows you to be found, right? That he allows us to go find him, that he allows us to know him. But here, you know, I think the, the other interesting thing here that uh, is in this prayer of David is that, you know, our hearts can trick us, right? We can have great intents. We can say great words. We can speak the things that God would want us to speak. You know, much like it says, the people that were prophesying his name, casting out demons in his name. But then when it comes to it, when God tries us, when he tests what's in our hearts, right, to see what our actions will be, you know, that's what matters, right? The question, you know, that he, you know, probably asks when he looks at us is, are we producing the fruit that God is expecting us to produce, right? He gives us a trial, he gives us a test, or he just, you know, goes about our daily lives, and are we producing the things that he's expecting us to produce? Not just saying, you know, words that we can read in the Bible, which are very important, but are we taking those words and are we putting them into action, right? Is that what's coming out of our life? 
Or is what coming out of our life something different? And we, you know, another example of this that, that Christ gave is in Matthew 21, verse 28 through 31. That's Matthew 21, uh, 28 through 31, and it gives much the same sentiment, right? Which is, it's not so much what we say, but it's the actions, it's the fruit that we produce. We can read here in verse 28, it says, But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted it and went. So he said, you know, in this case, he said words that were not, uh, you know, not what the father wanted to hear. But you could say he repented of it afterwards, right? He had a regret in what he said, and then he went and did the right thing. Then in verse 30, it says, Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I will go, sir. Right? So he said, you know, the right things. You can think back to the ones that were prophesying or were casting out demons. You know, they said the right words, but then it goes on and it says, But he did not go. So this son did not go. And then Christ ends in verse 31. It says, Which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said to him, The first. Right? So they knew who did the will of the Father. They knew the one that, even though he said he wouldn't go, but he ended up regretting it and went, he knows that that was the one that did the will of the Father, right? And so it's not just the words that we say. It's not the image that we put forth. It's what we actually do, right, in accordance to God's will. So it's not just enough to go do things, but you have to do it in accordance to God's will, right? And you could, you know, in some ways you could say that first son, he actually put out a negative image, right? He actually had this, you know, his father left probably with this negative image of him, but his conscience moved, conscience moved him, right, to do the right thing. And so, you know, it gives us this, this parable so that we know, right, it's never too late to go do the right thing, even if we do have this, this negative image. So then, you know, what is a test, right? You know, can God just read what's in our mind and just say, okay, I, I see what's in his mind, I see the words that he says, and is that enough, right? But we know it's not. We know from these parables that it's not. It's, you know, it's easy to say the right thing. It's easy when everything's going well to say the right things. It's even easy to do the right things when it's all good circumstances. But it's those times where things get hard, where things get difficult, confusing, or exhausting, right? Then that's where the real fruits of a person's heart can come out, right? And we know, you know, uh, many of us like to go hiking, for instance, and we know you know, if you're just hiking for a short distance, it's easy to go, you know, even with a little bit of a heavy backpack to go, you're talking, you're chatting, you know, no problem. But it's when, you know, things start to get long and you start to kind of, you know, one thing people can easily do is start to kind of focus inward, right? Every step gets harder. That backpack gets heavier. And this is what God wants to see. It's in those times, right? What are we going to do? And we know, you know, we've heard lots of stories, especially being here, where people, you know, get lost in the woods or, you know, out on a backpacking excursion and get lost. And they might be very close to some place that can save them. But when things get difficult, when they get hard, when they get exhausting, you know, that's where you start to get confused, where you can start to go off the path that you should take. And so this is, you know, how we should be thinking that God tests our hearts, right? It's, it's really those tough times, those hard times. And if you think about it, you know, you know, as God says, we can look at science as an example of what God does in our own lives. And so think about kind of the example of science, you know, with a black box, right? You have some black box. You don't know particularly what's in there, but you start putting stuff inside or you start feeling it. You start smelling it. You start touching it. And then you start to see what comes out the other side, right? You start to see what that is really made of. And so we can think of God doing that in our lives, right? He doesn't know from the start exactly what our heart's gonna, is gonna be made up of, right? Is it gonna be willing to follow Him no matter what, or is it gonna lean back on our own carnal nature, especially when times get hard? So what I want to go through this next section is I want to look at an example. And I think, you know, there's several examples that we could use, but I think Abraham is a very good example that we can use of God going through this process. Right. And so let's start in and we'll be in Genesis for quite a while. So if we go to Genesis uh, 22 and we'll actually pick up at the end of the story. And this is 
uh, when Abraham or when God tra- tells Abraham to go up to the mountain and sacrifice Isaac. So this is Genesis 22 verse 1. It says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. So he tested Abraham in this one case and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then in verse 2, he says, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Morah and offer him there as a burnt offering as one of the mountains of which I shall shall tell you. Right, and so we see here uh, in 22 verse 1 that God tells him to go uh, to the land uh, of Morah and sacrifice Isaac. And then picking up further down, it says, uh, let me see, no, I lost, miswrote the, the next scripture. Give me just one second. Ah, this is frustrating because now I can't read fast enough. Um, <laughs> so the 22 verse 1, let's see, where was that? This is why I always write my scriptures also on the paper, but I just did not write the whole scripture down. Okay, sorry, in verse 12, or verse 11, it says, but the angel, so this is after Abraham stretched out his hand to go kill his son. And in verse 11, it says, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And then in verse 12, it said, and he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from him. So we see here at the end of his life, or near the end, that God says, I finally know you. I know what's in your heart. I've tested you. I've tried you. What's in your heart? And I know that you're going to follow my commandments. Right? And we can see this as just one event in Abraham's life. Right? But really, when we look at Abraham's life up to here, it's actually a series of tests that God gives him. And it's only now, it's only after all of these tests and trials that God can say, I really know you. I really know what's in your heart, and I know that you're going to follow me no matter what. So we're breaking in, you know, if we just read this section, we're breaking into the middle of a long process, right? And so let's look at what came before this to see how this development happened. Right now, as we'll see, you know, it's not all positive. Abraham, in several cases, does the wrong thing, right? But after all of these examples, all the times that he obeyed God and all the times he disobeyed God, now it comes to this, you know, and it, God is able to say, I know you. I know what's in your heart, and I know that you're going to follow my commands. So we'll start over in Genesis 12, verse 1. This is, you could say, the beginning of the development of Abraham's faith. And we know this story well. It says in Genesis 12, 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right? So God is telling him to go away from all that he knows, you know, the people, his friends, his family, to go away from them because he has a greater blessing in mind for Abraham. And then in verse, in chapter 12, verse 4, it says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haram. So we see here, Abraham is 75 years old in this case. Uh, and his initial response is that he obeys God, right? God tells him to go, and he departed. He left. And then we can, you know, drop down a little bit further in uh, in Genesis. This is in 13, uh, 14 through 18, and this is another story that we know well. This is when um, after Lot and Abraham had separated, right? And so, you know, as we know the story, Lot and Abram's... Uh, Servants were contending a lot, and so Abram said to his nephew, you know, pick out the land that you want to go to, you go there, and I'll go in the opposite direction. 
And so this is, you know, after that, it says in Genesis 13, 14, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your servants or make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelled by the Tiberth trees of Mamre, which was in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Right, and so the Lord reinforces the fact that he's going to give Abram all these blessings. But in, through these, you know, these early stories, God's still not saying he completely knows Abram. Right? He doesn't know Abram completely. And then moving on in verse or in chapter 15, verse 3, you could say the next uh, trial that God gives him. It says in Genesis 15, verse 3, it says, Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Right? And so God had given him these great promises, but he had no offspring to actually leave that blessing to. And goes on, Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Right? So he had set up one of his servants as his heir instead of his own offspring. And then in verse 4 it says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness, right? So he believed what the Lord was saying, even though it looked like it might be impossible. And then dropping down, and this, you could say, is the first of the, the tests that Abram, where Abram actually failed the test. And this is in uh, Genesis 16, verse 4. Uh, it says, uh, and, and so this is after, it says in, in verse 1, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had bore him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Right, so Sarai had hatched this plan that Abram would go into Haggai and would conceive a son. And we drop down to verse four. It says, "And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that he she had conceived, her mistress, her mistress became despised in her eyes." Right, and so we see that you know after. Uh, dwelling in the land for a period of time that Abram gets impatient, right? Abraham gets impatient and he goes in and tries to do it his own way. He tries to do it, you know, you could say the carnal way, the physical way. And what's the result of it, right? The result is that Ishmael is born, right? And while God blessed Ishmael's descendants, he wasn't to be the promised son, right? He was he was actually a what it says a wild man amongst his brethren, right? So he wasn't following the ways of God, and so this was be the first test that Abraham fell. And at this case, he was about eighty six years old. So this was you know now ten years after he had originally came out of the land, and still it doesn't talk about God knowing him, right? It says that he that Abraham believed God and that it was accounted for him as righteousness. But God still doesn't know, didn't say, I completely know what's in your heart. I know that you'll obey me no matter what. But, you know, these stories can give us reassurance that even when there are times that we go away from God's plan, when we go away from following God, that doesn't mean God just cast us off immediately, right? So we see here that, that Abraham failed this test at this point, but there's still more to his story. Right, and so now we can drop down into Genesis 17, verse 1. And this, Abraham is 99 years old, so it's now 13 years after the Ishmael, um, after Ishmael was born, and, you know, almost 25 years after he had actually come out of the land of, of his fathers. And dropping down, uh, into, uh, and we know, you know, the story here that Abram, uh, uh, that, uh, Abram or the Lord appears to Abraham and reconfirms the fact that he's going to have a son. And dropping down in verse 17, that's Genesis 17:17, 17, 17, it says, "Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed." Right? We, you know, I, at least for me, I often remember that Sarah laughs, and we'll see that. 
But this, actually, Abraham falls down and laughs when God tells him this. And then he said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and his de- and with his descendant- descendants after him. Right? And so we see here that God reconfirms this fact and how Abraham, you know, reacted. He, you know, he shows some doubt in God. He shows some doubt that God can do it. He says, you know, just, just basically work with what you have. You know, Ishmael's here. He's 13 years old. You know, just work with this, please. Right? And God says no. You know, God confirms that he's going to do it his way. And then dropping down next into into verse uh, into chapter 18 and we'll just go quickly through those these cuz we you know know them well but it's interesting to see this progression right so you know Abraham started off really well right god told him to leave his leave uh, where he was from and he just departs but then the ishmael uh, you know ishmael is born and that goes against god's will and here Abraham's starting to show some doubt in God, right? By laughing and just saying, you know, please do it this other way, right? But God, you know, continues to work with him, continues to test him, continues to try him, even when, you know, in these cases you might say that he's he's failing along the way. And then dropping down to uh, Genesis 18.10. So again, you know, even though God had said that Abram would have a son, he still doesn't do it immediately, right? He, he makes Abraham continue to wait. And then uh, in verse 10 it says, And he said, and this being the Lord, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And then it says, Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So again, you know, in this case, it's Sarah who's not not having full confidence in God, but I think even as you know, as we read the words that God had to tell Abraham, I think God sensed that there was still a little doubt, a little bit of doubt in Abraham's mind, right? Because he has to reinforce: is anything too hard for the Lord? Right? He has to say that he's going to come and do it. So again, you could say that you know God is not, or that Abraham is not, you know, completely passing these tests as as we might expect someone. That you know, the father of the faithful. He's he's showing doubt along the way, but God continues to work with him. And then again, uh, another example of of Abraham not showing full faith in God is in Genesis twenty, and this is when uh, Abraham and and Sarah go down uh, to Abimelech, and so this is you know Abimelech is a ruler uh, in the area. And Abraham, you know, instead of saying, you know, God has made all these promises, we know that God will protect us, what does he say in verse 2? It says, Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Right? So again, you could say Abraham's not fully having confidence in God or and not fully trusting that God will do the things that he said he would do. Right, but it goes on, and we see near the end of this story, in verses seventeen and eighteen, it says, and so you know, Abimelech took Sarah, and all of Abimelech's household was then barren. And then in verse seventeen and eighteen, it says, so Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Right, and so this is actually the story right before when Isaac is born. And you know, I, as I as I read through this story, I wondered if this was kind of a turning point back in in Abraham's life when he starts to 
fully trust God again, right? Because we see, you know, time and time again in this period that God, that Abraham doesn't have this full faith in God. But then we go on in verse, in chapter 21, 1 through 7, and this is where Sarah conceives and bears Isaac, right? And at this point, Abraham's a hundred years old. So this is, you know, 25 years after he left, right? And it's only after all of these things that we get now into Genesis 22. So we see, you know, kind of the progression up in Abraham's life that Sarah then finally conceives and bores Isaac. They're, you know, roughly a hundred years old at that time. And Abraham, you know, has shown a number of instances where he didn't fully trust God. He didn't have full faith in God. But now, you know, God then tells him, tells him this uh, thing that he wanted him to do, which was to take Isaac up and to sacrifice him. And so we could, you know, see this progression. God now, you know, sensing perhaps that Abraham was ready, was ready to show the ultimate test, you know, through this process. And this is where we get to Genesis 22. And again, I'll just, you know, read it briefly where it says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Morah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And think back to when, you know, God, that, that think back to the time where Abraham laughed at God, right? At that time, he wanted God to just you know, use Isaac, or, or to, sorry, to use Ishmael as the promised one. He wanted to, God to deviate from his plan and just do what Abraham could see, what Abraham thought was possible. But by this time in his life, his answer is very different, right? You could imagine the same things are going through his mind, right? At that point, he didn't trust that God would give him another son through Sarah. And so he said, you know, just, just do the thing that I can see, which was make Ishmael my heir. But here, you know, it was much the same situation, right? He could have easily said, you know, how are, you know, how am I going to have all these descendants? How am I going to have these great nations come out of me if you're going to have me kill the one who's to be my heir, the one who's all of this is going to come through? But his answer here is very different this time, right? Instead of saying, you know, how about I just, you know, slaughter 5,000 sheep and that will be enough of an offering for you? Or how about, you know, we go about it some other way? What does Abraham do here? He gets Isaac, he gets, you know, the donkey and they start to go up. He then ties him to the altar. He's all ready to perform the sacrifice because he now, you know, knows that God will do the things that he says he will do. And then dropping into uh, Genesis 22, verse 9, we'll read this again. It says, Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Right? So it's after all of this process that he finally knew Abraham, that God finally knew Abraham and that knew that Abraham would follow whatever he said. Right? It was, you know, as we think back to the story at the beginning, Right? He knew him over a period of time. He saw all the things Abraham was going through, all the things that Abraham did, both where he obeyed God and where he disobeyed God, where he showed faith and where he didn't show faith. Right, And we don't know exactly how long a time this was, but this was likely over about a 40-year period. Right, If we think that it was about 25 years from the time he left his homeland to when Isaac was born, you know, and it was probably another 15, 20 years, something in there, or maybe even more when he takes Isaac out uh, to sacrifice him, right? This is a very long period of time. And there's, you know, both ups and there's downs. There's things that he obeyed on and things that he disobeyed on, right? And this is just 
one example of how God tests us, right? But it's a good example, I think, because it shows that it's just not a one-time event. You could easily, you know, jump right into Genesis 22 and say, hey, that was the one thing that caused God to know Abraham. But when you look over the entire story, it's a series of things that, that they're going through together, right? That they're working on together. And I think that's, you know, another important part is it's not God just remotely looking at you. It's God actually involved in Abraham's life. And it's the same with each of us, right? He might not be as, as, you know, talking to us the same way that he talked to Abraham, but he's still there with us. He's still there going through the process with us. Right, and these are just, you know, as I said, this is just one example of, 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 of somebody that went through. And there's other ways. There's other forms of testing uh, that are, you know, maybe not quite so obvious as these and just spend a little bit of time on this. But in some ways, they're very applicable to us at this, at this time. Right, so another example of how God will test us uh, is through false prophets, right? So, having people come in his name and saying, you know, things that are contrary to his law. And we can see this in Deuteronomy 13. This is in Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. It says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or a wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. And then in verse Three, it says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. All right. And so this is, you know, one way that God tests us. Right. And we can think of that, you know, within the church today. Right. If someone comes and starts preaching something contrary to the word of God, something contrary to the Bible, even if it's, you know, good words, even if they show signs, show wonders, right? This is what it's talking about. Someone is coming and doing great things. This is, you know, one of the tests that God gives us, right? This is one of the things that God does to know whether we love him, whether we love his commandments, whether we will obey them no matter what. Or if we'll just go off the first time we see something that looks amazing, right? This is one of the ways. Another way, which I think uh, is is interesting, is that God can actually withdraw from us for a time, and we'll we'll look at an example here. But I think it's it's interesting. You know, we think about God always being with us, and while He's always with us, you know, He will sometimes withdraw some distance from us to see if we're gonna back away from him even further if we're going to go towards him if we're going to seek him right and this is in second chronicles 32:27 and this is the example of hezekiah right and we know hezekiah was god says he was a, a good king right he was a righteous king but this is hezekiah and near near the end of his life and if if you recall you know hezekiah was the one where uh, god said he was going to die and then Hezekiah prayed to him and God gave him a number of extra years. And this is, you know, after that time. And so, you know, Hezekiah and God, you could say, had gone through a lot of things together at this point. And this is in Second Chronicles 32, 27. It says, Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock, and fold for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself, and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. Right, and we know, you know, as I said, Hezekiah was a righteous king. God blessed him for his righteousness. But then dropping down to verse 31, it says, However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to, to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. And we know, uh, you know, this story that the ambassadors uh, had come and asked to see, 
you know, see what Hezekiah had. And Hezekiah showed him all the wealth that he had. And God said after this story that this was, you know, the Babylonians were going to come back after the time of Hezekiah, but the Babylonians were going to come back and take all of that wealth. Right, and we see here in verse 31 that God withdrew from him, right? Put some distance between God and Hezekiah. And the reason was to test Hezekiah, right? Was Hezekiah going to, you know, as I said, kind of lean towards God, going to seek God, going to try to go and find God's will? Or was he going to back up even further from God? And we see in this case that, you know, he essentially backed up even further from God. He didn't ask God whether he should you know, show the Babylonians all the great wealth that he had. No, he just went and showed it. And you could think, you, you know, you could imagine Hezekiah perhaps thought it was a small thing, right? He wanted to show how much wealth Israel had. He was proud of what had, you know, what he had accomplished, but he had forgotten where that had come from. He'd forgotten the reason why he had all this wealth. He'd forgotten the reason why he was even alive at this time, right? And so, you know, think of that for you and I, right? Are there times when we feel God pulling away from us? And it might be to test us, right? And in that time, we have to think, right? Are we going to resort to carnal methods? Are we going to resort to our own ways? Or are we going to seek God, right? We know that God says that if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you, right? And if God is constantly the one that's drawing near to you first, Right? Perhaps as the, the example of Hezekiah, he might draw back for a time, right? To see how you are going to react, right? If he's always the one that's putting the first foot forward, he might draw back and see if you're going to seek him, if you're going to try to draw near to him, and then he'll draw near to you again, right? So this is another example of how God tries us and tests us by withdrawing from us for, for a time. And this doesn't mean, you know, completely out of our lives. This just means giving us some space to do what's in our hearts, right? Giving us some space to do uh, what is really core to us, right? Will we draw near or will we back away? Another way, and this is, you know, similar to the one in Hezekiah that God tests us, is by actually blessing us, by giving us good things, right? And you could, you could, you know, imagine saying, yeah, that's how I want to be tested, how I want to be tried. But when we look around us, you know, in the nation today, in the United States, this is actually a, a, a hard test, right? This is not something that's easy to overcome when you're given great blessings, when you're given good things. You know, it's very easy to start to draw away from God. Right, And we see this is another one in Deuteronomy. And as I said, actually a number of these examples are from Deuteronomy in this, uh, in this message, this last message that Moses gave the children of Israel. And I think it's, you know, as I said, it was his very last message. And he wanted to make sure that they were ready for the test that God would give them, he, that they were ready for all those things that God would test them. And this is in Deuteronomy 8, verse 11. It says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flock multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, all these things that God had done uh, for them, right? It says, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power and to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Right? And like I said, isn't that the United States today? We've been blessed beyond measure by God. You know, God has been testing us, and what have we done with those great blessings? We haven't used them in the way that he would have us to use them, right? We haven't used those blessings to draw closer to him. We've actually used those blessings to say, 
you know, that we've done all this. You hear, you know, all the, the rhetoric today um, about what we've done and how if a disaster happens, we're going to go rebuild. You know, we'll build it even bigger. We'll build it even greater than it. It's nothing about God blessing us, right? It's nothing about God giving us this great blessing and be the one who will strengthen us back up, right? It's all about how we can go do these things, right? And so much like ancient Israel failed in this way by these great blessings that God had given them, you know, we're failing today, right? And we know ultimately, right, it's this, you know, the pureness of our work through our life will be tested, right? We know these examples that I gave, these different ways that God tests us, you know, ultimately it's going to be tested, as God says, in fire, right? It's going to be tested in fire one day. And this is in 1 Corinthians, and I won't, you know, read all of it, but it says in verse 12, it says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is, right? God says that, you know, we're all, our whole life is going to be put through fire and that what comes out, we'll know, he'll know about us. He'll know, right, what we built was of gold, silver, precious stones, you know, those things that God would have us do, whereas it would, hay and straw. Right, And it goes on and says, If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. Right, And we know, you know, what is kind of this building with wood, hay, and straw? Right, It's, you know, all only the feel-good stuff, only the superficial, the, the very shallow things, right? It's not repenting, it's not changing, it's not growing over time. It's not accurately understanding God. It's not spending time understanding the things that God has given us to understand in the Bible, right? You know, things like doctrine. Are we firm in our doctrine, right? Are we looking at ourselves continuously? Are we repenting? Are we changing? Are we growing? You know, it's not about being perfect as we saw with Abraham, right? There were many times. You could say out of those stories, probably more than half of the time, he failed a particular test, right? He didn't have full faith in God. He didn't believe that God would do the things that he said. But in the end, right, that what mattered was that God ended up knowing him. God worked with him throughout his life and ended up knowing him that he would follow his commandments, right? And what are the things that are gold, silver, precious stones, right? It's the word of life. It's this Bible, right? It's the things that we know God tells us in here. It's being able to repent, being able to change, being able to grow, right? It's Conforming to his will, even if it might be hard, not making excuses, right? And if you think about these things, right, all of these things are permanent. All of these things are lasting, right? And so when they're passed through the fire, they're still there, and they're actually even better than before they went through the fire. But all the superficial things, right, if it passes through fire, it won't last. It'll be destroyed. And so as we begin to close, just a few more minutes, as we begin to close, I want to look a few more words from King David. As I said, you know, he was, you know, one who also gave this very same sentiment that Moses gave. And if we think about him, he was also a man that God tested, right? And he often failed, much like Abraham, right? But we know what happened in the end, right? We know that God himself calls David a man after God's own heart, right? He was a man that God knew. And as we'll see from these Psalms, you know, David understood how God came to know him. David understood that it was a process. And we'll see that through a number of these Psalms. So the first one is in Psalms 26, verse 1. It says, a Psalm of David, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I will not slip. Examine me, O God, or, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. Right? He's not just, you know, kind of going through the process. He's actively asking God to prove him. He's actively asking God to test what he's made of. Right? And you know, as as I said, oftentimes what came out of that test was, 
David wasn't good enough, right? David didn't fully trust in God. David didn't fully obey God. But he was going through that process with God. He was actively looking for God to try him, to test him, to show him the things where he needed to improve, where he needed to work on, and those things that were you know, precious and that he would continue to do. Another example is in Psalm 66, 10 through 13. It says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You know, back to this notion of precious of precious metals. It says, You have brought us into the net. You have laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. I will go to your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, right? David understood how God came to know him, that he was being tested, that he was going through things. You know, he was having afflictions laid on their back, through things that no one would want to go through. But he understood at that point that that was what was needed, right? And as I said, in a number of these Psalms, what's interesting is that David wanted God to know him, right? David wanted God to know him both inside and out, know him completely. God or David actively looked to God, actively asked God to come and know him, to prove the things that were in his heart, right? I mean, you know, if you think about why God said that David was a man after his own heart, we at least don't read of anyone else that was so active in having God test him, so active in having, of asking God to try him. And the last one that we'll read is in Psalms 139, verses 1 uh, through 6, and then we'll drop down. It says, For the chief musician, a psalm of David, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And then dropping down to the end in verses 23 and 24, again, David, this sentiment of wanting God to know him, wanting God to search him, it says in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, right? David knew he wasn't perfect. He knew that there was things that he wanted, that he had to work on, but he wanted God to know all of those things, right? And then in verse 24, and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting, right? So David knew he wasn't perfect. He knew there was things that he wanted to work on, right? He wanted God to see even the wickedness in him so that he could lead him into righteousness. Right? And this is the way that God gets to know us, right? Gets to know us by testing us, by trying us. And these aren't always, as I said, difficult things. I mean, it might be that you get great blessings and that's how God tries you, right? But ultimately, you know, there are many things that God will try us and test us on that are uncomfortable, right? But it's all necessary for our salvation, right? And like Abraham and David, It'll take most of our lives for God, if he ever is able to, to come to that point to say that he knows us. He truly knows what's in our hearts and minds, regardless of whatever situation he puts before us. But that's what we're going through, right? Whatever we're going through, God is putting before us so he can know. He can have confidence that we will do what he says, that we will follow his commandments no matter what. right? And where we want to get to is we want to get to that point where we can say that God knows us. And we'll read one last one last uh, set of scriptures here is Jeremiah 12, 1 through 3. This is the sentiment that we want to be able to build. Right? It says in verse 1, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? You have planted them, yes, they have taken root. They grow, yes, they bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their minds. And then in verse 3, this is what I want you to focus on. It says, but you, O Lord, know me. Right? Jeremiah Harris has such confidence in his relationship with God that he knows that God knows him. Right? It goes on, it says, you have seen me. You have tested my heart towards you. 
pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Right? Do we have that same confidence that Jeremiah had? Do we know that God has tested us, has tried us, and knows what's in our hearts? Are we trying to build that confidence every day with God? Right? When a trial comes upon us, are we falling back on our own ways, our own carnal ways, or are we looking at that trial that God's giving us and seeing you know, if we are following God's way? Right, in making it through that trial and making it through every day so that one day God can say, yes, I know you. Right? It's not easy. As we can see from you know, the lives of many of, the, of the, the men in the Old Testament, people like Abraham, Moses, David, all of which I talked about today, they often failed. Right? They often failed, but they all moved forward. Right? And we have to do the same thing when we fail, when we sin. And one of the most important ways, right, we're just coming from the Feast of Tabernacles is we have to keep the vision in our head of what God has in front of us, right? Imagine that time that's coming, right, when we're standing in front of the very throne of God, right, with Jesus at his right hand, right, and from God's throne it talks about the proceedings of lightnings and thunderings and voices, right, the seven lamps of fire, right, that are burning by the throne the 24 elders that are sitting on their throne, right? Imagine that time when you're there. You're there with God. You're there with Christ. And imagine that time when Christ then stands before all of them, before all the angels, before the elders, before God himself, right? And he says, here is my servant, right? Whom I know through the good and the bad, through the long, tough road, right? Through his entire life, I know, now know that servant. And here is my servant. Right? I know him. And here is that new name that I am going to give him just for him to describe what he's been through. Well done. Enter into the joy of my Lord, for I know you. 